thank you for joining us for ZAP. Can nuclear medicine give us superpowers? Non-surgical treatment of metastatic and unresectable pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. This session is of the Pheopara Alliance virtual conference. My name is Mary Langell, and I've been diagnosed with metastatic pheochromocytoma. I'm here with Dr. Daniel Prima, who I'll properly introduce in a few minutes. But first, this program is brought to you by the Pheopara Alliance, whose mission is to empower patients with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, their families, and the medical professionals through advocacy, education, and global community support while helping advance research and accelerate treatments and cures. Special thanks to Progenics and Advanced Accelerator Applications for making this conference possible. Before we get started, I'd like to mention Pheopara Awareness Week, which is this week. There's plenty of ways you can participate. All info can be found at pheopara.org, shared on social media, and attending virtual events. Our agenda today will be Dr. Daniel Prima, who will present for about 25 minutes. Then I'll briefly share some experiences and ways I can encourage you all to embrace your inner superhero with focus on mind and body wellness. I'm certainly hoping that I can help with that. Then we'll begin answering questions from all of you, our attendees. The information presented on this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not substitute the advice of your doctors and medical team because they have in-depth knowledge of your personal medical history and current situation. The content of this program is not influenced by any of our sponsors or supporters. And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Prima. Uh, he is the expert for this session. And uh, he said he's kind of an informal guy. I'm just gonna read a little bit of what I've got here. Uh, He's a man of many talents. Dr. Daniel Prima is the Gerd Mulliner Professor of Radiology and Chief of the Division of Nuclear Medical uh, Imaging and Therapy at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. That's where he focuses on therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals and companion diagnostics. He's also a co-leader of the radio biology and imagining Imagineering, imaging, imaging program at the Abramson Cancer Center and serves as chair of the imaging committee for NRG Oncology. Dr. Prana, you have the floor. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. I know I've put in a lot of um, words that don't exactly roll off the tongue, um, but I appreciate it. And I love the, um, the superhero no. thing. Um, and so be talking about nuclear medicine and the superpowers it can give you and how we can treat metastatic and unresectable pheo and paraganglioma. And so when we talk about nuclear medicine, it's, it's a, a relatively small and um, nuanced specialty in nuclear medicine. Um, one that I think a lot of people in medicine haven't really heard of or know the full scale of what we do. Um, and so it's, it's a little bit... Um, in the weeds, but there's there's sort of three different general areas we do. We do single photon imaging, um, PET imaging, and then we do therapy. And all of these things involve administration of a radiopharmaceutical. And I'm gonna be focusing on the therapeutic radiopharmaceuticals today, but talking a little bit about how the imaging plays a role in selecting patients as well as planning for the treatments. And so radiopharmaceuticals are drugs that are radioactive. Um, they have some targeting component that determines where they go. They have an isotope that determines what comes out, whether it's going to emit something out of the body that we can capture to make an image or emit something much more locally that can, can do a treatment effect. And then the drug component itself, that targeting component typically doesn't have a drug effect. So it's not like an aspirin where you're taking, you know, 325 milligrams and, and that aspirin does something. The targeting drug that we have, we're giving it in tiny, tiny amounts, and it should really have no significant effect. But as we'll talk about, there are some cases where 
with therapeutics, that's not always exactly true. There are a bunch of radiopharmaceuticals that play a really important role in patients with pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma. Um, the mainstays we're gonna talk about are MIBG and dotatate, um, which are super important. MIBG um, we'll talk about first and then dotatate at the end, um, which is a somatostatin analog. FDG, which is a radioactive form of sugar, can play a role and we're not gonna talk about that very much. I think there was um, a speaker yesterday talking more about the imaging. And then just the first plug for clinical research. There's a lot of clinical research going on. Um, anyone on the call who has pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma will understand that it's a really rare disease. There's not a lot of trials that focus specifically on this disease. Um, and so where there are opportunities, I think um, it's, a, it's a great option for people. Um, just that's the only way we learn about what works and what doesn't. Um, and there are trials that even if they're not focused solely on FIO and para, that include FIO and para in them. And so, so really worth thinking about. So MIBG stands for meta-iodobenzylguanidine. And if you say that a few times, you'll know why we call it MIBG. Um, when the FDA generic name for it is iobenguane, which rolls off the tongue in such a way that we still refer to it as MIBG mostly. Um, and it's not a new drug. It was first published in 1980, um, but it wasn't actually FDA approved as a therapeutic until 2018. Um, and I love this picture. This was at the Abramson Cancer Center celebrating the FDA approval. And um, I love, I, I always liked the picture, but I love it more now just because it reminds me of how nice it was when we used to be able to gather as, as a big group. And hopefully we're, we're really close to that again. Um, but this was a big deal because it was the first drug FDA approved for the treatment of advanced pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, and it remains the only one that's approved specifically for that indication. And what MIBG is, and this is a, a cartoon from a paper that was looking at the heart, um, but it applies here as well. You have cells that release hormones. And in this picture, any is norepinephrine, but, but it can be epinephrine, norepinephrine. These, these hormones that kind of rev up the body, turn on that fight or flight uh, response. And interestingly, everything in the body, whenever you have a signal that gets sent, the same cell that sends the signal typically turns it off as well. And so there's this uptake where it says net, that's not neuron endocrine tumor in this situation. It's called the norepinephrine transporter. And so whenever these, this cell releases these hormones, it immediately begins to suck them back up to, to turn off the signal, to control it so that signal doesn't go out of control. And MIBG gets taken up by this norepinephrine transporter and gets pulled back into that cell that's releasing the hormones. So in this case, it's a nerve that's sending signals to the heart cells. But in the case of pheochromocytoma or paraganglioma, it's the cells, the cancer cells that have those transporters. And interestingly, not every patient with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma has a tumor that's releasing hormones that causing those classic symptoms of high blood pressure and fast heart rates. Um, but even the cancers that don't release those hormones, a huge percentage of them are still expressing this transporter that's taking it back up. So if you put MIBG near the cell, it's going to suck it up and it's going to store it away. And then that radiation is going to release and either come out and image where those cells are or it's gonna release, if it's in the case of I-131, therapeutic radiation in that area of that tumor and, and treat it. And so again, this is the only FDA approved treatment for advanced FIO and para. Um, it's a high specific activity formulation that's been FDA approved. And that's, um, I don't wanna to get too much into it and have people fall asleep right away, hopefully wait 10 or 15 minutes before that. but. Um, there's, there's some nuanced reasons why that's advantageous to help prevent symptoms during or shortly after the, the infusion of the treatment itself. The regimen is typically this amount of radiation, eight millicuries per kilogram up to a maximum of 500. So most adults are more than 62 kilograms. So most patients, this is the, the maximum dose is 500 millicuries and given 90 days apart. But then we do something called dosimetry where we do measurements to figure out what's the maximum that you as an individual can receive and the treatment is, is capped at that. So we plan to give up to 500, but limit it to whatever the individual patient can receive to not 
give too much dose and, and cause problems. And this is a, an MIBG scan. So these are the scans we look at. This is a patient who does not have FIO or para. So these are the normal structures. So you see uptake in the salivary glands. Um, you might see the thyroid, even though we give people drops to block the thyroid, the thyroid is just really amazing at, at taking up some iodine. You might see the heart, the left ventricle of the heart and the liver and some excreted stuff in the bladder. So most of what doesn't get taken up into the tumor cells comes out in the urine. And so that's why you see the bladder. And that's why we worry a lot about the urine from a radiation safety perspective. Now, the way we make this image is we're imaging the gamma rays that are coming out of iodine, radioactive iodine. And for, for those of you who are in the Marvel universe, you'll know that the Hulk got his powers from gamma radiation. Um, so hopefully you guys won't look like that by the time the hospital is done doing your scan because um, a lot, all hospitals are very different, but the one thing that they all have in common is flexibility with schedules. Um, and so things don't tend to happen on time and you might feel like this, but um, it's probably not the gamma radiation. It's just the inevitable delays. This on the other hand is a patient who has paraganglioma. So this is the primary tumor in the belly um, next to the aorta. And then you can see some other kind of subtle spots here in the spine, um, in a rib, in, a, in the shoulder bone there. Pretty typical pattern of, of spread for this. Um, it can go into the, the liver, the lymph nodes, things like that. And so this is a patient who, um, if he or she needed treatment, you would think that this, this tumor is taking up the MIBG and that would be a good thing. I'm gonna talk more later about um, PET imaging in paraganglioma. So right now, MIBG imaging is solely what we call single photon imaging, um, which is planar imaging, and you can do three-dimensional imaging. Um, PET is a different modality that has inherent advantages in terms of how it does the imaging. Um, and so if you can imagine, this is um, if a, a single photon scanner is your old school TV that you had 20 years ago, um, the PET is your 4K TV. It just, you have better contrast and, and resolution and things like that. And so we, this is a dotatate scan in a patient with paraganglioma. And we'll talk more about the role of dotatate. But suffice to say that things look, you can see them more readily on these PET scans um, just because PET is a better technique, but that doesn't necessarily mean that um, the, the MIBG scan, what you're seeing isn't, you know, isn't, isn't relevant. And this is still the scan that tells us the best about whether or not someone can benefit from MIBG therapy. And so once we decide that we want to treat somebody, we do something called dosimetry. And dosimetry is something beyond imaging, but we're using the same imaging scanners. But instead of doing that one scan, and, and with this scan, we're trying, we're scanning for a while, trying to get the image to look as good as we can. With dosimetry, our purpose is really to get quantification, to, to do measurements of it. And so the scans happen, they're faster scans, and we're not trying to, to really identify the lesions as, as clearly. We're just trying to get measurements. And so you can do that with a, a quicker scan. And so this is a patient who gets a small dose of the therapeutic MIBG, and then we do a scan right away. We do a scan either the next day or two days later, and then we do a scan either the third day, fourth day, or the fifth day. So three scans over three to five days. And this is looking from the front, and then the second set of images looking from the back. And you'll notice there's this thing next to the patient's leg. That's a bag with some radioactive iodine in it, and so that we can use that to, to do our measurements, to calibrate, so that we can measure exactly how much radiation is in each of these sites of disease over time. And then we can figure out how quickly the drug is clearing from the patient, how quickly it's clearing from the organs that we worry about, like the liver and the kidneys, and figure out how much of a radiation dose we can safely treat that patient with. Um, because the last thing we want to do is actually cause a patient harm by giving them more than their body can tolerate. And so after we're done, we do, we draw regions around all of these organs and around the whole body. Then we do a bunch of measurements. I don't want to belabor this, but there's a lot of work. Our physicists are incredibly good at what they do. 
And then we get an output. And in the pa pa uh, patient I just shared there, the output, the maximum allowed total dose came out to 400 millicuries, give or take. Remember, normally what we prescribe is 500 millicuries per treatment and two total treatments. So typically we give 1,000. In this patient, we figured out that giving more than 400 may be significantly problematic to the patient's organs and could cause more harm than good. And so this is illustrative of why we do that dosimetry. Most of our patients, we don't have to change the dose. The dosimetry indicates that they can tolerate that 500 millicurie dose. But in like 10 to 20% of patients, that standard dose would actually cause harm. And it's really very helpful to know that ahead of time um, so that we can avoid doing a, an unsafe treatment. And then if we do the treatment, most of our treatments are given in the inpatient setting. Um, the reason for that is there are limits as to how much radiation a patient can leave the hospital with. Um, and to minimize the radiation exposure to people in the general public, family members, things like that. And I'll talk about that some more at the end. Um, but typically most places in the United States can treat somewhere in the area of um, 200 to 225 millicuries of I-131 based treatment like MIBG in the outpatient setting. And so that patient where we figure out, no, we, we actually wanna give 200 millicuries per cycle, now that patient could be treated as an outpatient. Um, but when we do do the treatment as an inpatient, we, we do some things to prepare the room. So they put some plastic down, some places use paper, um, they, they wrap things up. And really these wrappings are to facilitate cleanup so that if something gets contaminated with radiation, you don't have to try to put this whole shield into a storage place because they're heavy and big and um, unwieldy. You can just put that clump, crumbled up plastic wrap um, we do put sheets on the bed, so you're not laying on plastic bags. Um, that'll be reassuring to most people. Um, this is our, our new hospital. It's a, they're just gorgeous big rooms that make it a lot easier for patients to be um, confined to their room for a few days. Typically three to four days, patients are in the hospital. Um, they do put some wrappings around the toilet to help cut down on contamination, things like that. Um, but, but really patients are in the hospital, not because they're really sick, but because they need to be there until their radiation levels drop so that they can be safe to go out in the public. Um, so most patients are generally do okay in the, in the hospital. As I mentioned, outpatient therapy can be administered if the dose that you're giving is low enough. So the two situations are, one is where you're doing everything exactly how we intend to, but we found that the patient can't tolerate so much and we, we give a, a lower dose and we can do it as an outpatient. Um, we've had that situation come up in several patients now. Um, and then there's MIBG, as I mentioned, has been around a while. And so people have explored different dosing regimens and things like that. Um, and some people have, instead of 500 millicuries times two, people have looked at things like 200 millicuries times four at three month intervals and things like that. None of that is FDA approved, but it seems like it is helpful to patients in many cases. Um, we found that patients with, with disease that's growing a little more aggressively probably really benefit from that higher dose up front. Um, but a lot of patients, if, if the disease is progressing but pretty slowly, um, can do pretty really well with, with a lower dose regimen. And I've had patients say to me like, I, I want this treatment. I need this treatment. I just don't want to be in the hospital. Um, and so we say, well, we can do it as an outpatient. It's, it's a little different, but it seems like it works pretty well. And um, hopefully we're trying to develop some of the, the data around that to really understand how, you know, how does it compare? Um, and then there are some hospitals that just don't have the wherewithal to do these things as an inpatient. Um, and they could offer this in the outpatient setting. So it is, it is feasible. The side effects, I put these sort of in order of when they happen after treatment. Typically, the first thing that happens is salivary gland pain. Um, usually, the, the first, the morning after treatment, the first thing the patient tells me is they feel like a squirrel. Um, they're nuts in their cheeks and um, they feel like, you know, their salivary glands are sore and swollen. Usually, it doesn't last very long. Um, and permanent damage to the glands is super rare, but, but things swell up and then they go down. Around the same time, nausea and vomiting can happen. 
And nausea is, is a generic effect of radiation. So if you give radiation in any way, in a sufficient amount, people will get nausea. Um, we can control that pretty effectively, but not, we can't make it completely gone. We can control it pretty effectively, um, especially in the um, inpatient setting. A lot of patients whose blood pressure is elevated because of their cancer, um, and they're on a lot of blood pressure medicines at the time of the treatment, very often this isn't going to happen right away. Typically in the week or two weeks after treatment is when we see the blood pressure start to um, change a little bit and, and typically start to drift downwards. And very often the biggest change is you can cut back on some of the blood pressure medicines after the treatment. Um, which for those of you who are on alpha blockers, taking less, of, less alpha blockers is generally a good thing. Um, blood counts can drop. They usually hit their lowest around four to six weeks after treatment and then bounce back in most patients within a week or so. Um, but in some patients, it takes a lot longer to, to come back. The, the radiation can have an effect on the thyroid gland in about 3% of patients. Their thyroid becomes underactive at some point and then they need thyroid hormone pills. Um, we worry always with pretty much any cancer therapy, but particularly radiation and, and chemotherapies that, that kill cells, that they can themselves cause cancers. Um, so it's, it's still a relatively rare thing, but it's something that we do really worry about. And this is why we don't just treat every single patient the day that they're diagnosed. We want to wait and make sure we treat patients when they need treatment. Um, because there are some side effects, both early and late, and um, some mild and some pretty serious. So switching gears here, I want to talk um, a little bit about somatostatin receptor. Um, it is a receptor. So somatostatin is a hormone. Somatostatin receptor is overexpressed on a lot of neuroendocrine cancers. Most of the, really all of the FDA approvals related to radioactive drugs targeting the somatostatin receptor are limited to neuroendocrine tumors, which most of us would consider pheopara as neuroendocrine cancers, but neuroendocrine tumors, from an FDA perspective, they're really talking about the pancreatic and the gut neuroendocrine tumors. Um, and so, so a lot of the uses in pheopara are technically what's called off-label, um, which means they're still definitely medically valid, but there are some caveats around their use. Typically, we're imaging with PET scans instead of those single photon scans. And then you probably heard the term PRRT, which stands for peptide receptor radionuclide therapy. So somatostatin is a peptide. The somatostatin receptor is a peptide receptor. And so that's why where this generic name came from. Um, but typically, most people apply it just to this somatostatin targeted treatments. There are two FDA approved PET agents that I'm sure you guys heard about yesterday, copper 64, gallium 68, dotatate. And it's important to reiterate that it's probably the single best imaging test for patients with advanced FIO and para. Of all the things that we have out there, it is the one that has the best chance of detecting the disease. Um, and so it's terms of, we wanna see, is there disease? Are there new sites? It's really, really useful. Um, it's not perfect. No imaging test is perfect. So there are some patients where we don't see it on Dotatate and we see it on MIBG or we don't see it on either, but we see it on MRI or CAT scan. Um, but as far as the best single test, it's pretty good. It has a couple of holes. One is it's, it's not very good at looking at the adrenal gland themselves, but not for this talk. Um, the bigger one we have is we don't really know yet what that means for treatment selection. So doing a somatostatin PET on a patient, we don't know what that means in terms of choosing what is the best treatment. And this is an example of a patient who has a neuroendocrine tumor and the top row is an Actria scan. So the old school single photon. So this is basically the same thing as an MIBG scan, but for the somatostatin receptor instead of for those norepinephrine transporters. And the bottom row is a dotatate PET. And these scans are done not too far apart in time and nothing changed with the patient. So the tumor was there for both scans. And you can see on the PET, it's very obvious. You see the tumor in the small bowel. There's this dot here. You see a lymph node in the, the fat between the bowel loops. And, and it's clear as day. Whereas on, on this scan, you don't see it at all. 
Um, and so someone might say, oh, on this scan, this patient won't benefit from dotate therapy. On this scan, the patient will say, look, it's lighting up like a Christmas tree. It's of course the patient's going to benefit. Well, dotate therapy is the same regardless of which scan you use to, to detect it. Um, and so PET is really good at detecting things and it might overestimate our notion of how someone's going to benefit. And it's very different from those single photon scans. So you don't want to compare this scan to this scan and say, this treatment's going to be better than this treatment because they're the same. Um, and so the same thing, we don't want to compare a dotate PET to an MIBG single photon scan and say, I could see things better on the dotate, therefore dotate is going to be the better treatment. Um, having said that, lutetium dotate is FDA approved um, for GI and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, 2018 was a great year for radiopharmaceuticals for FIO and PARA, two FDA approvals. Um, this one's given in the outpatient setting and the typical regimen is 200 millicuries, just a flat dose for every patient given at eight week intervals um, times four treatments total. And one of my favorite expressions is if all you have is a hammer, you see every problem as a nail. So here's our Avenger Thor, um, Thor with his hammer, screwdriver, and crescent wrench. Um, and so there are a lot of centers in out there in the community in nuclear medicine and radiation oncology that use lutetium dotatate. Um, the, those GI and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors are more common than FIO para. So they have patients, they have the treatment available. And so they sort of say, well, I've got that hammer, I'm gonna treat every patient like a nail. And so the, the knee jerk is to, to use or want to use dotatate for treating patients with FIO para because it's available and people are comfortable with it. Um, but we have other tools. And so we want to we want to think about that really quickly. The, the treatment for this is more applicable to patients with um, the neuroendocrine tumors that are probably on a somatostatin analog. You have to schedule around that for field para patients. They're less likely. So it's not an issue. Um, we treat patients with anti nausea medicines and we give this amino acid infusion that um, helps protect the kidneys from the radiation dose. The amino acid infusion is actually what causes a lot of our problems because it causes significant nausea for patients. Um, and it takes about four hours to give. So um, typically patients, they're there for about five hours for this treatment. Um, we worry about the, the radiation damage to the kidneys. It's really not much of an issue with the amino acids, but um, the, the simple infusion of amino acids, the one that has only what you need and doesn't cause a lot of side effects, isn't actually specifically FDA approved. So we have to get it from compounding radio pharmacies and we keep running into issues. We've had a bunch this summer, you know, supply chain problems where all of a sudden one supplier doesn't have it. And our pharmacy does an amazing job of sourcing this, um, but, but it's a lot of work for them. Um, we see nausea and vomiting similar to the MIBG, fatigue, decreased blood counts, um, we can see some radiation damage to the liver and second cancer is similar to the MIBG. We have seen, um, so there's a clinical trial out of the NIH looking at dotate therapy specifically in FIO para. Um, and they've published a couple of papers related to some hormone related toxicity that, that made people really sick in FIO para, um, where the hormone release caused by the treatment got, got the patients um, pretty critically ill. So. Um, I, I anticipate once that trial is completed, we'll see that there's benefit as well as risk. And, and that's why we do research um, so that we can get the, the full picture. Um, because of that, I'd like to, we don't know well yet, dotate in para. We know that there's definitely patients who have benefited. We've used it. Um, we don't know overall when you take a whole population, what's the percent that benefits, what's the percent that's at risk and things like that. And so Anyone considering dotate for FIO para, I'd really recommend um, if you can get to the NIH to see whether you qualify for their trial. Um, we desperately need that information. and We'd love to see that trial enroll quickly. Um, very quickly here at the end, just talk about radiation safety precautions a bit. Um, radiation is something that is, is pretty scary. We think about the Hulk, we think about big mushroom clouds, but it's important to recognize that radiation is actually everywhere in the environment. If you have a Geiger counter that's turned on, it's pinging all the time. There's radiation from the sun, there's radon gas seeping up from the ground, um, all kinds of things cause radiation. 
And what we want to do when a patient's treated with a radioactive drug, we want to limit the radiation that they emit that exposes other people. We want to do that to, so that the, the dose isn't significantly higher than what they're getting from all those other sources. Um, the way to do that is minimize time and maximize distance. So in the COVID era, you just say social distancing. Um, if you're six feet away from someone, they get no significant radiation exposure. You don't want to touch any food that anyone else touches. Um, most of the radiation is coming out with both of these drugs, mostly in the urine. Um, so, so we always tell, particularly the men in the audience who are we're just slobs by nature, that they need to sit when they go to the bathroom and flush twice and um, not spray things all over the place. We want to prevent pregnancy for at least six months. Um, and the restriction, the isotope, the amount that we give determines how long the restrictions are. So typically the same restrictions, but they'll be longer for a really high dose of I-131 than they are for Dota take. Um, some questions that come up all the time, can treatments be given more than once? The answer is typically yes. If a patient benefits and then years down the road, they need treatment again, if it was successful, most patients can get treated more than once. Um, there's some really exciting work being done with alpha particle emitters. Um, related to, to both of these treatments that, that may actually improve the safety and improve the efficacy, hopefully. And then the $64,000 question is, what's the right sequence for these things? And that's a, that's a tough question to answer. Um, because MIBG is the only FDA-approved drug, I really feel strongly that patients have an opportunity to, to get access to it. Um, and just because we do know that the safety profile and the efficacy profile, so getting an MIBG scan, if positive, finding a site that can give it um, is, is really valuable. But other than that, it's, there are a lot of nuances um, in each patient. Everyone's an individual, and there might be things that might push us one way or another um, in, in the treatment options. So just in summary, radiopharmaceuticals play a big role in field para. Um, sequencing and weighing the options is really important, and there's a lot of work we can still be doing. And I will stop there. Thank you very, very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Prima, for all this useful information. And um, I was quite fascinated, honestly. Uh, I, I learned a, I've learned a lot um, over the last couple of years and learned a lot more today. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my journey and hopefully provide uh, some way to hopefully empower yourself um, as, it, as it relates. Um, I wrote down a few things here and um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to uh, share my story and hopefully give some more helpful tips. Um, my personal journey revealed itself in 2019 when I was incidentally diagnosed with a nine centimeter pheochromocytoma on my right adrenal gland. I had complained to uh, my family doctor, who is phenomenal, um, that I just did not, I had an overall feeling of unwellness. I went to her in 2017. She said it looked like mono. Uh, keep in mind, at that time, I was 55 years old, and I just said, you want me to stop kissing the cuties with cooties now? <laughs> um, it was um, about 11 months later, I went back, and um, I said, you know, I, I still, I don't feel right. I was doing my normal activities, but I was just getting so tired, and she said, Strangely, it looks like mono again. And, you know, it was only 11 months from my first time. So the third time I went back, a few months later, um, she said, eh, something's not right here. She ran every single test she could. And she says, I think you need to go see a specialist. And I said, I kind of feel like it's hormonal. Um, and we discussed some options and she decided to send me to a hematologist. I went to see the hematologist and um, he thought it was lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, said he wanted to do a scan of my abdomen to look at my lymph nodes. And lo and behold, there was the nine centimeter fear chromocytoma. And my attitude at that point forward, you know, when someone tells you you have a tumor, 
especially the, a tumor that big, um, you, you get scared. My first thought was, well, let's pop it out. And he said, it's not quite that simple. And so I happened to live about an hour and a half from Cleveland Clinic. And so I was sent there and I was prepped over the next couple months with alpha and beta blockers. I uh, had surgery and they removed my, uh, had a phenomenal surgeon and he removed my tumor laparoscopically. Um, I kind of expected I was going to wake up and find a a full incision, a full open incision, but did it laparoscopically. Uh, took me a few months uh, to recover from that. Um, and I w- went in for my checkup a few months later and everything was great. All of my tumor markers were spot on. They were perfect. I was feeling wonderful. It felt so good to feel good. Uh, then COVID hit. Um, everything was okay, but I started feeling some of the same old feelings. It was about 11 months after my surgery. I went in, that's when they did some more tests and they found out that, uh, my pheochromocytoma had metastasized to bone, liver, and lung. Um, it was moving quite rapidly, which surprised them. At that time, I decided I was going to advocate for myself and, I started calling around. I wanted the least evasive treatment. Uh, To shorten a story, after calling a lot of places all over the country, consulting with the NIH, consulting with a place in New York, I decided to stay with Cleveland Clinic and I did a trial uh, uh, for a medicine called ANC 201 with Dr. Peter Anderson. And that was great. It was the least evasive. I want, it was all about quality of life for me. Uh, There was no side effects. Unfortunately, that treatment did not work for me, Uh, but I was glad to be a part of that um, uh, opportunity. I, they then decided that my, uh, it was moving very quickly. And the last case scenario for Cleveland Clinic was uh, chemotherapy. I did three rounds of CBT um, chemotherapy, lost my hair, didn't feel well at all. That's not what my end game was. Uh, we decided after three rounds, there was absolutely, it was not helping me at all. It was harming me more than anything. At that point, Cleveland Clinic determined they had nothing else for me. But my, my original oncologist said, I'll send you wherever you want to go. Uh, he ended up sending me to the James Cancer Hospital in, uh, at OSU in Columbus. Uh, they had the Azedra treatment. It's available at about 14 places in the country, from my understanding. And I was fortunate enough that I lived in Ohio and I was an hour and a half from Ohio State. I received my first, I, I, I did my dosimetry in December um, and everything Dr. Prime had talked about today, spot on. Um, my advice about that is drink lots and lots of water. Remember to drink lots and lots of water. I went on a Monday, I went on a Wednesday, I went on a Friday. Uh, drove back and forth. Uh, there really was no side effects to that, except for um, wasn't drinking enough water and a little tired. Um, they decided that I was uh, accepted into that program and I received my first treatment in January. I was admitted on a Monday. And uh, they did all the testing and everything they needed to blood work wise, got me all set up. I walked into the room and it was just like the picture that was just in the slide. There was paper on everything, plastic and anything. And honestly, my attitude was, this is an adventure I've never been on before. Let's see how this is done. Let's see how it goes. Um, The team that administered my medicine on Tuesday morning was phenomenal. Everyone on the team knew exactly what to do. The actual uh, medication delivery took about half an hour, about 30 minutes, 35 minutes by the time they flushed it. Um, it didn't hurt. Didn't make me sick. Uh, my 
little bit of advice is make sure you go pee before they start this because they are pumping a lot of stuff into you with the fluids and stuff. Uh, and you can't move. You know, they, they put all this stuff into this machine. It's very fascinating. It looks like an incubator. They bring in this, 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 uh, uh, these, this big tube. And it's got like a big syringe in it that they hook into some other tubes. And they, um, they injected that into an IV in my arm. Um, I do have a port that stayed in all week. And that was just for saline. They did not use the port for the application of the medicine. Uh, they unhooked me from that and they scanned me. They said, yes, you're hot. Um, that was, there was, there was no pain. It was not uncomfortable by any means. Um, I was in the room for, uh, till Friday of that week. They came in every day, checked me with a Geiger counter. The room was wrapped in paper and plastic. My advice in the last couple minutes here, um, I don't watch television. I did take my phone. I took my tablet. I stayed in contact with my family um, and um, looked out the window. Didn't get sick. I came home. I, I'd like to mention that when you do go in, number one, please don't be afraid. There's nothing to be afraid of. Um, my second treatment was exactly the same as my first. And um, I can tell you a couple little things. I had a lot of stuff written down, but I got off track here. I just wanted to say, um, when you go in, consider taking disposable clothes. And by that, I mean old clothes or clothes that you can go get from the Goodwill. That way, when you change clothes, you can just throw them away. You don't have to worry about bagging them up and bringing home any kind of radioactive waste and having to bag them and all that. Just throw your clothes away there. You're not going to be able to take showers. They have everything taped off, but they will um, supply you with you know towels and stuff so you can wash up every day. Your food's going to be brought in on disposable trays, um, most likely to be cold by the time you get there. Order cold food. Just my suggestion to you is just order cold food and that way it's, or, you know, you, you're good to go. Salads are great. Um, make sure that during this treatment, you're eating good fruits and vegetables, good fiber, small balanced meals, um, and um, be aware of how your body feels. Be aware of um, the... Um, you know, it, it, of how your, your bowels are moving and whether you're sweating. I can tell you that after the treatment, there is an expulsion of the hormones from the somostatin receptors. You're going to have some hot flashes and you're going to have um, some emotional things going on. Um, they won't last forever. They last for about 12 hours. Um, in, in wrapping this up, because I rambled on a little bit too long, um, let me just say, you're not going to be able to have any visitors or anything there, but lean on your faith in whatever that might be. That's what got me through. And I am now um, three months, four months out from my second treatment. I went in for my scans, uh, met with my doctor. I had some shrinkage, some tumors that have completely disappeared, and some that are just stable. And I feel amazing. I went from not being able to get out of my chair and thinking if I needed to walk to the corner and back, I was going to use a cane and I was going to do it to I'm now canning. I'm freezing vegetables. I'm helping my husband back out on the farm again. Maybe I can't ride horses anymore, but I bought myself a little Kawasaki mule and I take my grandkids out on that. It's all about quality of life for me. Find out what's important to you. That's where you're a superhero. You're stronger than you think you are. Um, just be blessed is all I can say. And thank you, Dr. Prama, for everything that you've done for the Theopera community. Because of people like you, I'm here today. And I can't thank you enough for that. Um, going back to my notes uh, that I've varied away from, um, it's time for some questions and answer sessions. 
Uh, one of the first questions that I have, and I'm going to take some from um, the attendees here, was um, Dr. Prama, you talked about receiving treatment as an outpatient. Um, how does that work, and where where is that available at? Yeah, so and and just first I would just thank you for sharing that amazing story. And my one piece of advice is don't sell the horses because give it another couple months and you might be back on. <laughs> yeah. Um so the outpatient thing is evolving and it, it really we don't have a ton of data to guide us. Um and it's more it's it's more of a pragmatic thing that there are some patients who just don't have access to inpatient therapy. So I think the the inpatient approach that you got that we tested in the trial is the tried and true and and is probably the the better way to start for most cases but if you it would still be better to get outpatient treatment than no treatment at all um yes. and it different sites are are talking about it i'm not sure if um i think any site that can give it inpatient could also do it outpatient um Hopefully, we're, we're working on a clinical trial to try to elucidate that a little so we can learn a little bit more about it. But I think it is available, but it's, um, it's still in, in a transitional period, if I might say it, say it that way. I see. Thank you. Um, and is the Ludothera-177 dotate, um, is that kind of like the outpatient? Is that similar? Or is that well, so the Lutathera different? is the Lutathera requires that amino acid infusion, so it's a five-hour visit and things like that. Whereas outpatient right. MIBG is typically like a twenty-minute infusion. Um, right. The radiation safety precautions are a little bit longer for I one thirty one, just because there's more radiation coming out. So it's like I said, it's the same stuff, but I think for Lutathera, we tell patients to sleep alone for one night, um, whereas for the MIBG outpatient, it might be five nights, that sort of thing. So it's it's right. similar, but a little tailored. Okay, thank you. Um, Jewel Melvin is asking, can you get radiation instead of having surgery? I have a paraganglioma between my aorta and pulmonary artery, and they will have to resect my pulmonary artery and aorta, and I would prefer they just shrink the tumor with radiation. Yeah, so two, two great things in that question. Um, one is the short answer is yes, we have treated patients who have typically we think about treating patients with when we say advanced disease, disease that spread places. Um, but sometimes advanced disease just means it can't be resected, but it's still um, in, a, in a bad location or it's growing and causing symptoms. Um, very often for a single site like that, we think more about external beam radiation. Um, which can be effective. And in some cases, we've done a combo of MIBG plus external beam, which seems to, to work really well without additive side effects. Um, so that's a thought. The one thing that, that was mentioned is about shrinking the tumors. And these tumors in mo most patients are pretty slow. They're slow to grow and they're slow to shrink. Um, with MIBG, we can definitely see some shrinkage. Uh, with external beam radiation, it's typically we see more of you can freeze them. Um, so they, they're no longer growing, um, but very often they don't shrink very much. Um, so, but, but typically, yeah, it, it sounds like it's in a location where a non-surgical approach may be the safer option. Um, and then, and then occasionally we have tried to do both. So we, we do a treatment like MIBG to try to shrink it, to make the surgery easier. Um, and, and so that's something that's done in a lot of other cancers. Obviously, FIO is pretty rare, so we don't have a lot of experience, but it, it, that sort of approach makes some sense. Thank you. Um, there, I know that the FDA has only approved uh, a Zedra for two treatments now, um, or two cycles. Um, and you mentioned that it's a possibility that it, if it has been effective, um, that you may be eligible for more. How long of a period of time um, do you have to wait? Uh, for example, you know, I'm quite content with where I am um, right now. I mm -hmm. feel as good as I did three years, probably better than I did three years ago, because I'm sure that I had to feel longer than 
you know, before diagnosis. Um, I feel better every single day. Um, I'm enjoying my life and I'm so happy with that, but there's going to come a point in time. I asked my doctor, you know, how much time did I buy? And he said, on average, maybe three years, might be longer, might be less. Um, I said, give me six good months. I would like to be, I'd like to have a um, cancer-free summer. And I am blessed that I have that opportunity right now. Do I have a little pain here and there? A little, as I call it, a hitch in my giddy up? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, he asked me if I wanted scan for, scans for that. And I said, no, I'll see you in December. We'll do scans then. But right now I'm done. I'm just done. And I have the right to be done, to say, I want to enjoy my summer with my grandkids. And um, I feel well enough to do that. Everybody has to do their own thing, but advocate for yourself. Um, so is there a hope for FDA approval for further treatments when I'm ready? Yeah, so so and I just want to clarify that. So so the FDA approval is this regimen that is two doses. Um, but just like on the bottle of aspirin, it says take two aspirin, that's the FDA approval, but four hours later you can take it again. Um, so there's nothing in the FDA approval that says two treatments and only ever two treatments. Um, so so we've we've treated, I'd say. I haven't done the math, but probably the majority of the patients that I've treated with the Zedra have been treated more than once. Um, eventually, we and, and just to your point, we try to spread it out as much as possible. Um, I actually, I've, I've seen a patient who was um, treated on the clinical trial, then several years later needed treatment again, we did it again. And then later on had treatment and said, well, we can do the two treatments, but he said, you know what? Let's just do one. I just, I don't like being in the hospital. Um, and, and we'll get like, like your approach. I'm going to buy myself some time. And that was two years ago. Um, and, and so it's, it's hard to predict, but, but we can take it each one, you know, one, one day at a time. And um, just because someone's been treated now, if someone got treated and three months later, things look way worse, we'll probably say that wasn't super effective. Let's try something else. But if someone's treated and okay. four years later, they need treatment again, they say, wow, that really worked. Let's do the same thing again. Um, and, and that seems like, uh, like a good approach. Okay. Um, Miss Jeanette, and I won't even attempt the last name, uh, <laughs> asks, can I do a Zedra if disease progresses after Luthera? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, in most patients, you can. Um, and, and the same thing that I, I didn't give the caveat that in most patients, we can treat with MIBG again. Um, but the way I always explain it to patients is, is we grow when, when we're born, our bone marrow is like a gas tank. And it's a huge gas tank. It's way more than we need. And every treatment we have, whether it's um, some kind of radi external beam radiation or chemotherapy or lutathera or azedra, each of these things sort of decreases the capacity of that gas tank. It gets smaller and smaller. And you can still have a pretty small tank and make plenty of what you need, um, but at some point it gets too small. And so with these treatments, most patients can tolerate multiple regimens. Um, and, and it doesn't really matter whether it's chemo or lutathera or azedra. If the blood counts are good, typically we can do another one. Um, and if the blood counts are too low, I think uh, we may have lost you. There you go. Oh, that's um, when we start to worry about it. That's when the risk gets a little higher. Um, so you're done. What was I saying when you lost me? Uh, I think I think it just picked up and finished. Um, okay. You were just right. talking about how they sometimes they're too small, but yeah, we can address that anyways. Yep. Yeah. So most patients, we can do Azedra after Lutathera or Lutathera after Azedra or two of one or two of the other one. Um, everyone's different. Some patients, even the first treatment is more than their body can tolerate, but that's the exception rather than the rule. Um, so most patients can be treated as they need to, but it underscores our desire to spread things out as much as possible because we don't want to 
throw the kitchen sink at someone. And then three years later, when they need another treatment, they can't because we've been too aggressive. Yes, I understand. Um, I have, there's one other question that was uh, kind of brought up. Um, a stable tumor in the chest that is small, would you recommend wait and see approach? If so, how frequent should scanning be to watch it? Yeah, so so it so because these tumors can secrete hormones, I would ask whether there's any symptoms from the hormones. Um, I've had patients where their tumors are small and they they don't look like anything we'd need to treat, but they're miserable from their hormones and we have to treat them. Um, but if they're it's not causing any symptoms and it's small, um, I would image usually early on. We might image as often as every three months, um, but once it's declared itself to be moving slowly, um, I typically try to not torture people very often and, and try to say, maybe we go out every six months and then hopefully once a year. Um, and for 364 days a year, you can not know that you have cancer. And one day a year, you got to come and get some scans done. And we say, yep, it's still stable um, and keep going. Yeah. And, and there are some patients who might go 30 or 40 years in that situation. And so, so there's, we don't know, we can't know who, who that is and who's, who it isn't, but um, we can only find out by, by not, not going too far, too fast, too soon. Right. Thank you so much. Um, I think that we've gotten to answer most of the questions that were asked. Um, and um, I wanted to toss in, I was only the the fourth patient that had ever been uh, received a Zebra at OSU. And um, they did an amazing job. And I'm hoping, um, I want to wrap it up with this last question. Is there hope for more centers, for more hospitals um, to make this program available? Um, you know, I was fortunate that I had one close by, but with 14 being available in the country, is there hope for more? There is. There's a couple of things. One is um, there's there's not a huge number, but they're spread out pretty well. Um, and it's a treatment that I think you'd agree you can travel for and get it if you need to. Yes. Um, so I would encourage patients that if your center says we don't do that, then call up the closest one and um, and get there. And there are actually some foundations that can support travel for people and things like that. So there, there are opportunities so that you're not having to, to spend the retirement funds on getting to and from the appointment. So there, there are options. There are hotels that a lot of the hospitals have um, where there are foundations that can, can put people up and things. Um, hearing stories like yours, hospital administrators see a, a treatment that's expensive and that's a rare tumor and, and that they think, well, why do I need to worry about this when we see you know 10,000 patients a year with breast cancer and prostate cancer? Um, and, and hearing stories like yours and saying, look, there is only one treatment FDA approved for my disease and I deserve an opportunity to get it because, um, and that's super important. And, and for, for people to hear that story is, is really powerful. So I'm um, talking to the insurers in the area, talking to the hospitals and, and making it clear that it's not okay to, to not offer it just because it's a rare disease, because, you know, people with rare diseases deserve treatment just as much as people with common ones. Yes, very good. And I can also assure you that, uh, and the, the, uh, the patients that are listening, the caregivers that are listening, that um, the uh, Progenix um, and uh, uh, Lanthius Corporation, uh, they reached out to me and they, they did offer help. They want people. I'm so thankful that there's a company out there that's producing this medicine that, as far as I'm concerned, is healing me from a disease that no one ever heard of before this. Um, and they, um, they do offer hope for transportation costs and housing costs and um, all of that. So please, don't be afraid to reach out to them if they don't reach out to you. Um, thank you, Dr. Daniel Prima, for your time and dedication to the patient community. Uh, special thanks again to Progenix and our other sponsors for making this conference possible. Uh, this and all sessions will be available for viewing on this platform. Please tune in to the rest of our conference sessions in the coming days. 
We also encourage you to participate in our awareness week. Go to fiapara.org for your toolkit and learn about ways that you can raise awareness. Dr. Prama, thank you again. Is there anything else that you want to add before we close? No, thank you. That was, that was awesome. All right. Thank you. I enjoyed it immensely. And um, uh, continue continue the good work and please be blessed. Thank you everyone who attended today and we wish you all a very good and healthy day. Thank you. Thanks.